decades. <laughs> uh, we're waiting for Gurdas, as usual. <laughs> I've been waiting for him for 50 some years now. <laughs> He'll be here. <laughs> I guess so we'll go ahead and start reading the Bhagavatam verse for today, which is 11th Canto, Chapter 7, Text 7. Yadidam manasa vacha Chakshur bayam shravana dibhi Nashvaram griham manam cha Vidhi maya mano mayam Yami dam manasava cha chakshur piyam shravana dibhi nashvaram griham manam cha vidhi maya mano mayam. Anyone? Oh, then I give it. Okay. Yat, that which. Idam, this world. Manasa, by the mind. Vacha, Vacha, by speech. By speech. Chakshur, Pyam, Chakshur Pyam, by the eyes. eyes. Shravana Adibhi, by the ears and other senses. Nashvaram, Nashvaram. temporary. temporary. Griyamanam, that which is being accepted or perceived. Cha, and vidhi, you should know. Maya mana mayam. It is only imagined to be real by the influence of Maya. Translation My dear Uddhava, the material universe that you perceive through your mind, speech, eyes, ears, and other senses is an illusory creation that one imagines to be real due to the influence of maya. In fact, you should know that all of the objects of the material senses are temporary. Per Prabhupada's purport. The question may be raised that since we find good and bad qualities throughout the material world, how can Lord Krishna advise Uddhava to see everything equally. In this verse, Krishna explains that material good and evil are a creation of the illusory energy, just as the objects of a dream are a mental creation. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, Lord Krishna is actually everything because he is present within everything and everything is present within him. Krishna is Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, the Lord and proprietor of all worlds. To see anything separate from Krishna is illusion. An attraction to any kind of material illusion, either good or bad, is ultimately useless since it obliges the living entity to continue wandering in the cycle of birth and death. This, this kind of simple idea that everything we see in the material world is illusory and impermanent was one of the, the very first ideas that Srila Prabhupada Ah, there he is, thank you. <laughs> One of the very first ideas that Srila Prabhupada, he wasn't Prabhupada yet, he was the Swami. Uh, the first ideas that Swami taught us, that everything you see is illusory. Oh, he taught us a couple of other very mm, simple ideas, that we are not this body, and that there is a, a God who is a person who has created all of this. Uh, we didn't have this book. We didn't have any books. We had the first two 
three, uh, first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in three uh, volumes, but we had no other information, written information. We just had the Swami, the personal Swami, teaching us every day. Now, usually when Guru Dice and I sit down <clears throat> to remember those old days, I kind of preface it with a little bit of background, context. It was hard for you to understand now what it was like in those days, 50 years ago. <clears throat> for the first time in history, all of it recorded history, a generation of young people uh, were born into high prosperity. Our parents had just gone through the ma a major depression with nothing, and then they had fought a world war, the biggest war in history, for five years. And when this war ended, we were all born more or less during that war. When this war ended, uh, the war machine turned into make, over into making consumer goods. Machines, washing machines, cleaning machines, driving machines, every kind of machine that would help uh, people reduce the time, uh, their working time. So suddenly there was leisure, leisure time, lots of it. We were born with uh, uh, everything from the time we were babies. And then we were given educations, high educations, college. We all went to college. So this combination of ingredients, historical ingredients, made us the perfect uh, seekers for something higher. We all wanted something more. After we had everything, material, but we knew there was something more in, behind this. But there was no tradition to teach us these things. So we all gathered, a hundred thousand of us, in one little city called San Francisco, one neighborhood of San Francisco. And the Swami stepped through this perfect historic window. He was born in another century and prepared himself to come to us. And he found a hundred thousand recipients. Uh, I don't know, Gurdas will will, uh, or kind of the, uh, I don't know, kind of a, a team here, kind of a couple of monkeys. And probably in those days we had discussions like, what do you think, Roger? This idea, I mean, God is a blue man. <laughs> On top of that, he's young, and he's got long hair like we do. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Hey, and he's got a beautiful girlfriend. You see that? <laughs> and he dances with her all night long. He sounds like a groovy cat, man. <laughs> and then all day he just plays with his buddies out in the fields. Whoa! I like this idea of God. But with the Swami telling us that and seeing the, the pleasure in his body and his face, his beauty at 70 years old, uh, and his in energy, endless energy, and then his being able to cite all of these things from ancient literature, ancient Sanskrit texts with deep authority. Uh, yeah, we got hooked on Prabhupada. Huh? A lot of funny things happened in those days. We didn't understand anything. The main thing probably, pr the Swami, the, was mo most of all, he was very tolerant with us, very liberal. Uh, he made us get married, if we had girlfriends. And he mm, told us we should give up intoxicants and meat eating and so on. But meat was easy, uh, gambling was easy. The intoxicants, we were pretty well hooked on every kind of drug you can imagine. <laughs> so we gave those up, more or less. But, you know, we still smoked. and. In fact, one of the things we, I remember most uh, clearly is after Prabh the Swami's initial lectures in the morning, we'd run out on the sidewalk and have a cigarette. Talk about it. Well, that was pretty cool, huh? <laughs> and our dogs would be there by the door. Um, sometimes they'd come running in the temple and Prabh the Swami would stop speaking and say, take that dog out. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't quite know why. I mean, he's another living being, like you're saying. Shouldn't he be in here too? 
uh, and we kept our hair long. So some of the devotees had big be bushy beards. Prabhupada didn't, little by little by little, he spoon fed us the proper way to live. Uh, you have some story? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> no. Please. Tolerance. We have a lot of time, right? Okay. We do? Yeah. We started doing this last week in Vrindavan in Prabhupada's rooms, and we started at 1130, uh, 11 maybe it was, 11, and we were supposed to stop at 1230, and at 1 o'clock we hadn't even left San Francisco hardly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a million stories. Both of us had such mercy to be with Prabhupada right from the beginning. Uh, but I think it's important, and in my book, I've, and in Guru Das's books too, we've tried to present uh, what the Swami was like in the beginning, so that you could understand, future generations could understand how, how he seduced us, what kind of lives we lived before we met him. But we can say pr that his personal example is what did it, and we didn't have the books. Uh, we didn't have uh, any tradition or map how to do this. No one had ever been to India. In those days, Prabhupada was the first Indian man I ever met. Mm. Mm. There was no information about yeah. India or the, the traditions and scholarship, and the deep roots of knowledge from India. We had a, a feeling, an instinct, it must be coming from the Far East somewhere. So we read every book we could about yoga and Eastern philosophy. We knew the answer had to be there because they were the oldest. They were the oldest. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Swami treated us with kid gloves in a way. And we knew right from the beginning that to become his friend or to get close to him, you had to kind of compete with your god brothers and god sisters to get his attention. And one of the ways of getting the Swami's attention, we caught on to this right away. He always told, he told us to chase the rhinoceros. Go for the biggest ideas to spread Krishna consciousness that you can think of. And he said, you will see Krishna, whatever you risk for Krishna, he will, he will jump in personally, intervene to remove the obstacles to that service. So we tried for the biggest things right away. Hmm. The big mantra rock dance we put on, so on. And, and this, Gurudas has other stories how he got in the door with his camera, I think it was the way he, he got into Prabhupada's uh, company, his, his association that way. Seva. Seva. Right. You have some, some story? I have many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, want, you want a theme? Uh, Did someone bring you to Prabhupada? Or? No, no. no. Just like uh, Radharani turns Krishna's head, Jamuna turned my head towards Prabhupada. <laughs> Mukunda turned mine. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We met through friends who had already met the Swami. And they, by their change in demeanor and their manners, and their, uh, we tested them. We tested them for months. Are they, you know, they, but they, after months of refusing drugs and all the other things that we tried to, to entice them with, uh, Mukunda and Jamuna were so happy all the time, and they uh, refused everything. So we thought, well, this Swami must have some really powerful influence. So he's for us, too. We were convinced by our friends as much as anything. We don't have to do the chronological story. Mm -hmm. We can continue to glorify Prabhupada, and then we'll, we'll get into the Beatles okay. and all of that. Carry on. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, Radha Gopinath, you dropped something last night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just returning. Chasing the rhinoceros, 
Seva. It was such an adventure just going into his room. Opening up vistas of possibilities, worlds. And yes, be very, even bold for Krishna. We got the sense because slowly he even revealed what he went through. We didn't even know what he went through. There was no book that said Prabhupada went on the Jala Dutta. And he didn't, that was then and this is now. Slowly we got some information. He didn't tell us. No. Didn't tell us to bow down. Didn't tell us about a Vyasa son. There was a Native American totem pole to the right of the altar. <laughs> he played on bongo drums. <laughs> so, one of the themes I want to continue, besides the great story and everything, the adventures, the Beatles here, Krishna Balaram Temple, the whole wonderful adventure, I want to tell some stories that I don't think you've even heard before, <laughs> or you've even heard before to show you the spontaneous, the Navayovana aspect of Krishna consciousness. To make it so exciting that when you chant it, it's an old friend. It's a confidant. It's a transparent me by a media you speak to yourself. So, Prabhupada was so much fun to be with, and he took us every place, even Lalit Prasad Thakur. I think he liked us because we just let him set the mood. We didn't have any hidden agendas. We just loved the Swami, I think. I don't know why he took us along, <laughs> like to Gorachan Goswami. That's a great story. I don't know if we'll have time, but uh, he took us to Gorachan Goswami's to have prasadam. Yeah. If there's a lot of time, I'll tell that story. Yeah, I guess. Okay. That's, in fact, that's a wonderful story to emphasize the theme Of, of just how much fun it was to be with Prabhupada. So much so that we gave up all the pleasure. It was, it was out there, free. So, Prabhupada comes to me and he says, Guru Das, what do you think of Gorchan Goswami? Now, Gorchan Goswami was the Saivite, the caretaker in a Goswami family However, you realize shamans, spiritual people, there's three aspects of how spiritual people manifest. One is they inherit it, like the Goswami family. And it doesn't mean they're doing it well. And that's what was happening there. They were just doing the minimum. The other is you're elected to be a leader but you know, you can pay for sheep to elect you. So that's not anything. The best way is that deeds manifest, and then that person deserves to. So Prabhupada asked me, what do you think of Gorchan Goswami? And I said, uh, he's a rascal, but a charming rascal. He is. He's a, he was charming. He was bigger than life. He was blind. He used to smoke beaties right there out in the porch. But he's yelling, go Binda, go Paul, too. <laughs> so, Prabhupada says, 
I want, let's go, to, he's invited us to lunch there. So I, he invites Dr. Kapoor and me and my old buddy, <laughs> I, this Cockney kid called him Sammy Shoe, and I was Goo Goo, he couldn't remember the Sanskrit names. Good old Sammy Shoe comes along. And uh, so Gorchand joins us because we're family and it's all of Prabhupada's favorite Bengali shukta stuff portal, all in mustard oil, misty doy. <laughs> I don't know if you get it on this side, but if you ever had it, it's heavenly. So when Prabhupada was really enjoying, we're all sitting on the veranda of Radha Damodar Temple. The deities are there. Gorchan's house is behind, and his wife is bringing the prasadam. And Gorchan is sitting there, facing us by the door. Prabhupada's here, myself, Dr. Kapoor, and Samarshinda. Now another thing, Prabhupada used to, because he saw my reaction like a little puppy dog wagging the tail, he'd bite something and throw it on my plate. So it was <laughs> maha maha. <laughs> so not only that, but when the, now this is when Prabhupada really liked the prasadam. He put his hand down like this so he could really get into it. And Prabhupada didn't talk. He respected prasadam. He didn't talk. Most of the time he ate alone. We were talking about it last night. So Prabhupada's, and he's throwing on my plate, I'm wagging tail. We're all enjoying it. Gorachan's there. He finishes. He decides he wanted one of his beaties. I don't know why people smoke beaties after a meal, but they do. <laughs> we did, I guess. Uh, but, uh, so he goes behind the door and he smokes the beady. However, he's blind and he didn't realize he was in front of the door. So he's like this. Prabhupada liked Charlie Chaplin movies, so he was like miming. And there's smoke billowing everywhere. And he's like this. And Prabhupada's like this. I see it and I'm about to laugh, but I'm a yogi. But I go like this to Prabhupada. Prabhupada looks up and he bursts out laughing. Now I can laugh and Dr. Kapoor's got a great sense of humor and then you laugh. Radar, he, tell, he can tell it's at him. He stashes his beady and goes, Go Vinda, go Paul! <laughs> when, this, so we're, okay. Oh, go ahead. Well, I always l like being with Gurdas before and now and forever because we shared a certain kind of uh, rasa, special rasa with Srila Prabhupada of laughter. I think if you go back through all of the photos, and there's something like 30 or 40,000 <laughs> photos. Number one, there's not a bad photo of Prabhupada in the lot. And, but if you see Gurudas or I anywhere in the background, 80% of those shots were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else is... <coughs> Because we saw a certain kind of humor in Prabhupada. We loved him so much. And when you love someone so much, you can, you, you're laughing. It brings out laughter. You're so happy. You're so joyful. I mean, he would, Prabhupada could, could segue into any mood immediately. Mm. He could be mm. angry, then laughing, then mm. uh, negotiator, and then... Uh, you could talk him into anything. So we watched him slide through these moods, and to us it was funny. It was, Prabhupada once told me that, the, that laughter was the difference between what, what you expect to happen and what really does happen. <laughs> <laughs> so you could never tell what Prabhupada was going to do. You always expected him to do this, and he did the opposite, or, or he did something different. And it just, Gurudas and I were always cracking up, <laughs> even in the most serious discussion. He's talking, probably the, the serious side of this meeting you, we were having with Gorachan was very serious, because Gorachan and Prabhupada had this 
wonderful rush of bargaining over the rent on that temple room. <laughs> Prabhupada was saying, paying something like five rupees a month, and his lease was expiring. <laughs> and Gorchan was trying to get him up to seven, and Prabhupada was sticking to his guns. They weren't, he wasn't going to go for six even. He was going to stick at five, and this went on for weeks. Uh -huh. And actually, there's some photos I took of them doing it, a whole series, and he's going like that. Yeah. And I had to go to Matra to negotiating for years for these rooms. <laughs> and the, the lawyers, Prabhupada called them liars, they're out, <laughs> outside on tables, and their files are held down by rocks. <laughs> and I had to do this for years. They had that rasa, yeah. That was one of your constant uh, services wherever we went. You had to go and get the paperwork done. <laughs> <laughs> and you typed it up. <laughs> you imagine sending this guy in 1970, 71, to build a monstrous temple. I mean, blocks square, Prabhupada said, this temple should be. Or he had to somehow, he's probably never mixed a bucket of cement in his life. <laughs> He's got to somehow get 400,000 <laughs> tons of cement in a marketplace where it was rationed. And certainly, because of war with Pakistan and so on, certainly they weren't going to uh, 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 allow any cement for building more temples. Somehow, he got this task of getting steel, cement, and all of these things to build this giant temple. This is By preaching... They said, well, we have the cement for movie theater. <laughs> and Tarin Kandi Ghosh wanted to build a Disneyland, and he's carrying the Chaitanya Chaitanya. And so, you know, it's a no-brainer. You, you present the positive alternative of transcendental ideas. Yeah, Prabhupada, but you get a glimpse of how Prabhupada's vision worked. He sent us off on these impossible tasks. Mm. Impossible. Uh, at a time when there was uh, great disruption in the government, we had no money whatsoever. And he would say, ah, 400 tons of cement should go here. Where is this money going to come from? But he pushed us into, into these various tasks yeah. in a way that we have to look back and think is funny. It's really amazingly funny how, how we were able to do that. Mm. <sighs> Fun. Every, every moment was fun with Srila Prabhupada. So you never knew when you opened the door to his room what was going to happen in the next few minutes. Yeah. But it was just going to be fantastic, whatever it was. Yeah. My turn? Your turn. <laughs> Before I was a devotee, I was involved in the civil rights movement in the United States. And I'm in an objective way, proud of it, because it was something I believed in, and I was threatened to get killed, but I believed in it. And there was a song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, and the songs kept us going. We shall overcome. Keep your eyes on the prize. Then I joined Prabhupada, and it, and it helped me to do all these bold things. So our eyes are still on the prize. It's a different prize. Just to show you Prabhupada's humor and wide thinking, Right he near here, we're, we're living together in a nice jungle house. And uh, I don't know if everybody knows the difference between impersonalism and personalism. But uh, personalism is we have a relationship with Krishna, Radha, each other. Impersonal is basically you become God, you think you're God. It never appealed to me, but uh, 
and they're called Mayavadis. So a group of Mayavadis come to see Prabhupada, and he was very cordial. He always made people feel comfortable, and he tried to find a common ground. Unless it, unless it was needed to be confrontal, like he really gave the vice president of India, S.S. Radhakrishna, the source for his impersonal Gita. That's another story. But these ones he was very cordial to. And they all had some books. And they put them on the table before Prabhupada. And then they left. And then Prabhupada gave us each one of their books. And I'm thinking, what does Prabhupada want me to learn the arguments of the Mayavadis? And this one's in Telugu, and this one's in... And they're very thin books. I think Prabhupada did show some of his thick books. Yeah, I remember that. They had their thin books, and Prabhupada pulled out a couple of his thick books, you know. <clears throat> so we each had an impersonalist book in our hand. And then Prabhupada takes this uh, Bombay Chavda. What is it called? You know, it's a mixture of chickpea and coconut. What is it called? Judah. Bombay Chuda. He takes it out and he puts it on each of the books as a plate. <laughs> <laughs> and walking with Prabhupada was so nice, so nice. I had so much association and Someone asked the question, who had the idea to start taping Prabhupada? Do you know? Do you know? That was done early on. Even in New York, in Ramananda's time, they got him a tape recorder. Yeah. But taping him speak? Well, when I became secretary, I, I did that. That's great. I think I was the first to do that. Now, I have so much association with Prabhupada, but uh, on walks, Everybody tried to get close to him. You see a lot of photos. Prabhupada walking with his, a lot of photos walking with his legions, right? So if I wanted to be next to him, I just took the tape recorder there. Oh, good, I'll says the tape recorder. Even though there's no tape deck in there. No, yeah, no. sometimes I didn't have the tape there. Good, I said. <laughs> So we're walking and hanging gardens, and somebody says, oh, there's G.D. Birla. Oh, no, that's S.K. Birla. Prabhupada says, any Birla would do. <laughs> so we're walking, and he says, how do you know Krishna is God? And I said, you told us. And uh, uh, somebody else says, no, the Bhagavad Gita says so. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is an example of time, place, and circumstance. Because if you understand time, place, and circumstance, then you can, it can help your spiritual life. Because it's not rigid, it's not archaic. It's not in the past, it's in the now. Time, place, and circumstance, Prabhupada showed us this. So how do you know Krishna is God? You told us, somebody said the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Prabhupada says, no, they will just say I am old man. Someone said the Bhagavad Gita said so. No, they can just say I'm, uh, it's a book. And then Prabhupada says something very beautiful. He said, you know Krishna's God by the ecstasy you feel. The proof of the puddings and the eating. Because the Navayovana whatever ecstasies, whatever it is. And the hierarchy is this way, not this way, das ano das. An administrator may have some expertise, but is it better than the cook in Krishna's eyes? No. So time, place, and circumstance can help. So the ecstasy you feel, whatever it is. So then a year later, we're in Philadelphia, we're on a walk. I'm back there. Prabhupada stops. Everybody tries to not run him over. 
which say <laughs> succeed. How do you know Krishna is God? Someone immediately says, well, you told us, Prabhupada, they will just say, I am old man. I pipe up. You know Krishna is God by the ecstasy you feel. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> no, Bhagavad Gita says so. <laughs> <laughs> But he did want me to learn Hindi more. And when I didn't, he said, yes, no, very good. <laughs> the man comes from India, and he comes west, and the man says, uh, did you steal the watch, right? What is it? Yeah, what is it? He's accused of stealing. Yes, accused of, did you steal the watch? Yes. Uh, Will you give it back? No, you're going to jail. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So, in Vishakapatnam, I'm in the temple, and in India, uh, in, well, in Vrindavan, it's very soft on this side. It's nice. Prabhupada's office. In Vrindavan, you have to put one shoe on one side of the temple and one shoe on the other because of the monkeys. <laughs> and the same thing in Vishakapatna. So Prabhupada's going by, going by, and he's walking, and I run after him, and there's shells and everything like that. <sighs> he says, where are your shoes? There's enough tapasya in the world, enough austerities in the world that we don't have to put any more on ourselves unnecessarily. So this is another great realization in our spiritual path. I'll do one more story and then I'll hand it over <laughs> for a bit. In Vrindavan, I was known for not wearing shoes. I've seen Krishna... Balaram dance, Das from Neem Karoli, Mohan. Hmm. I don't know we weren't there, but there were just a few. But Guru Das didn't wear shoes because he heard that Vrindavan's a temple. So Guru Das' feet got a little bit tough, but his feet did look for shady places. <laughs> that he would look for where a tree was so he could go there and another tree so he could go there. And I'm walking with Prabhupada, again I don't have the shoes, and he sees me walking gingerly, he says, where are your shoes? And I said, well in Vrindavan, it's a temple, they say you shouldn't wear shoes. He says, follow in the footsteps of your spiritual master. And he had shoes. And it was another lesson which Sam Rishinda tries to tell me it was also a, a, an in, a subtle thing that be more businesslike, be be more practical. Don't be so poetic sometimes. Go on, your your turn for a while. Can I carry on? It's your turn. Yeah. Oh, it's my turn. If you want, oh. <laughs> I got plenty to say. Well, you brought up so many wonderful yeah, ideas yeah. in my mind, you know. One, the first one was perseverance, mm. how Srila Prabhupada kept going after mm. ideas that he wanted done. Beyond mm. anyone's, I mean, he, he, made it, he aggravated us so much sometimes with his desire for something to happen. And he pushed us and pushed us and pushed us and pushed us, pushed himself more than anything to make it happen. These huge temples, big projects. Uh, Perseverance was one thing. Uh, uh, the morning walks. But I, hearkening back a little bit to those earliest days, which it may not be too clear to people, uh, <clears throat> when, Sri, when the Swami came to America, he first landed in New York, and he was there about a year and a half before he came to San Francisco. And in New York, he learned the ways of Americans to some extent the crowded cities of America, the, the pollution maybe, the, 
the noise, the crowds, the, the, uh, he, he was more disciplined with his troops there because they were mostly men, young men. And he, you know, in, he focused more on rules and regulations, things like that. But when he came out to San Francisco, well, we were Californians. We lived in the sun, and we liked to have fun. So he learned a whole new way of living with Americans. He, le he was learning as much from us as we were learning from him, in a way, in the early days. He didn't know how we did things yet, so he just observed us, and he tolerated all kinds of stuff. For the first time, he had many ladies' disciples, women. Our wives and other ladies came. There were many women as men in the, in the temple. Mm. Mm. So we learned from him how to deal with the society around us through his eyes, but he was learning through us also. Uh, uh, he took his first plane ride to San Francisco from looking down. The first thing he said when he came to the temple and sat down with all these hippies in the room, he said, he said, hmm. Uh, that he exactly from this verse that that uh, looking down there's a cloud below the plane and if you are on the earth you will look up and you won't see the sun or the sky this is illusion this cloud of illusion so take the fr fly the friendly sky he came on United fly fly the friendly sky to Krishna and you will be above the clouds of illusion so he was learning all these things speed. Uh, we had an old beat-up Ford car, and, the, and our freeway systems, 70 miles an hour was the speed limit. And probably I had to drive him sometimes here and there to the immigration office or whatnot. So he would get in the car, and the front seat of the car was broken, so it leaned way back. So Prabhupada would be sitting <laughs> way, way back in his seat. <laughs> My dog was in the back seat. <laughs> And we'd be flying down the freeway at 60, 70 miles an hour. I could look. I looked over at Prabhupada, really worried that it, maybe this was upsetting him. And he, I could tell he loved it. And he said, "Just go a little faster. We are late." <laughs> <laughs> he had never been 70 miles an hour, <clears throat> an hour in an automobile in his life. So he was learning all these things from us. He, he didn't know the meaning of certain words. He would ask. And one of the favorites is the word donut <laughs> yeah. on the shop. He thought it was do not. <laughs> <laughs> the do nots for America. Yeah. Uh, and it, the, the first time we all went walking together on oh, Hate Street, yeah. you have to imagine there's a street in San Francisco <laughs> called Hate Street. H-A-I-G-H-T, not H-A-T-E. And on this street had congregated that summer of 1967, it was called the Summer of Love, a famous event happened. A hundred thousand young people dressed in the most outrageous costumes appeared on this street, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, music and laughter and wildness in the air. So we had an engagement up on Haight Street and had to walk there from the temple, which was on the, uh, a few blocks from Haight Street. And as the, the Swami walked with us down the the sidewalk, the crowded sidewalk, two things went through my mind. First of all, these people all think they're really cool, <laughs> but we're the coolest because we've got a swami with us. <laughs> he, he was cooler than Miles Davis. He was He's cool. And at one point, I looked over and said, Swamiji, is, doesn't this all seem very unusual to you? Isn't this very strange? And he said, I am an old Calcutta man. <laughs> right, uh, right. Years later, I understood what that meant. <laughs> you couldn't stump the Swami on anything. You couldn't take away his equilibrium. What you tried to do is get him to laugh or, or amaze him. We used to call it in the hippie world of blowing someone's mind. That we, would, we would try to blow Prabhupada's mind with some fact or something and get that look <laughs> in his eye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you did that, that was the highlight of your yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Didn't happen very often. I got, I did, I got one photo of that one. Yeah, yeah. you're the one who yeah. those pictures. Uh, 
Do you remember what he was saying? No. Prabhupada, Prabhupada, living with the Swami was like just an endless parade of delight. Uh, whatever he said, we took it, took it to heart. And uh, the, our biggest pleasure, I think, in Gurudas in my lives is to see how, what happened, how all this happened from Srila Prabhupada's little desire uh, from the beginning. Hmm. This is wonderful. So laughter, perseverance, what are the other qualities? Tolerance, Compassion, forgiveness. Passion. Mm. forgiveness. So many. He, he, <laughs> should I tell the Malati story? Yeah. Malati got everything. She was able she her she Jerry Garcia gave her a stove. Uh, it's a stove to do j japatis on. So Swamiji lived in an apartment above the, par the uh, temple, storefront temple. And uh, he's looking out the window. And as I said, he, he liked Charlie Chaplin movies, so he knows mime. And he sees Mala, this, the driver of the truck, go into the corner store with some milk and a few things. And she goes into the back of the truck and takes a whole flat of butter. And it's big, and she's going like that, and she goes in the temple, and she fills up the refrigerator with butter, and she's so proud. Well, about an hour later, the Swami she wants to see you. Well, we only had one dhoti and one sari in the movement. She puts the sari on. So you have stolen the butter? She becomes protoplasmic butter herself. <laughs> like, I mean, she's tough. <laughs> Sam Ashinda knows. She's a tough woman. She's tough, but she, she just melted because he saw. And this might have been the first chastisement. Perhaps. <laughs> At any rate, he says we should not steal. It's, it's not our property. We should treat other people's property like stool, he said. He said, it's Krishna's property. And, and she's feeling, we, we have to respect other people's property. But if you have to steal, then steal butter, because Krishna's called muck and chore. <laughs> What you mentioned earlier about time, place, and circumstance is so important. That's a good point. I mean, if it would have been somebody besides Malati, he might have gotten angry. Right. He might have said, you shouldn't steal anymore. Or, right. you know, or maybe, uh, yeah. yeah, you never knew what Prabhupada was going to say about our something. Horse. I mean, he, he applied his wisdom and... and according to the time and the place and the circumstances of the person he was relating with. So that if you go through all the Prabhupada's books and stories, it's too difficult to say, oh, this is the way he was. This over here is what he said. Because he might say the opposite thing 10 minutes later right. in different circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. And behind closed doors, he was different than his public persona. Yeah. That's a good point, too. We'll go into that more. But uh, an example of this kind of causeless mercy, I, my personality is that <clears throat> if Prabhupada ever got angry with me, I would probably have committed suicide. Mm. Now, he never got angry with me, even though I created the, did the greatest offenses all the time, as his secretary even. He never got angry with me because he knew my personality couldn't hold up under it. He would get angry at very angry at some devotees all the time because they needed it or they could live with that or they thrived on it. Some of these Vietnam vets and people like that, Tamal Krishna, he could get angry at them. But he could, if he did it to me, I would die. Now, one time we were, I was his secretary and I was in charge of traffic, travel arrangements. <laughs> all the Prabhupada's travel arrangements were on my shoulders. So we were in Nairobi in Africa. The Swami had spent over a month there, maybe six weeks, in this remote place. And everyone really wanted to get out there. It was, it was, it was you know, we wanted to get back to India. 
So he, there was a huge program lined up in Bombay to come he here directly here from Nairobi on East African Airlines. So we got in the plane, we flew here, and we went into the customs shed to uh, pass through customs. And they, the, the first desk had a yellow card over it, and it said you had to present your health certificates. So I went up to them and I said, what is that health certificate? Oh, you have to show that you have a yellow fever shots, inoculations, because you're coming from an African country where yellow fever exists. And I said, oh, we don't have those. And Prabhupada was looking and we were all standing there. I, and I kind of started to get upset. And the, the guy says, even if Indira Gandhi doesn't have that card, you, she can't get in. I said, well, what's the alternative? And they said, well, you can either get back on the plane and go back to Africa, or you can stay seven days in a quarantine prison here at the airport. Oh, I looked over at Prabhupada, expecting the worst, expecting that he would be so angry with me for not having these cards. But he, he just looked at me and kind of smiled, and he says, I think Krishna wants us to rest here for a while anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear a thousand devotees out in the airport having kirtan. They had to cancel the whole program. <laughs> yeah, when Upendra was in jail, he said, well, Krishna was in jail, but it would lessen because you're a devotee of Krishna. And like you mentioned, Vietnam vet, on Harinam in London, do you remember Jagannath Das? He was one of the early guys that came, and we'd be on Harinam, and, a, and an apple was coming towards me, and then it would go and hit him, he's right there. And it happened more than once. And he said, Kurdas, why did that happen? I, and I saw it too. It was going towards you, and then it hit me. <laughs> and I said, because you were a machine gunner killing people in Vietnam. And if it wasn't for Krishna, it would have been a bullet. <laughs> So the morning walks were delightful. We're under a tree. He says, what's the meaning of these bird droppings? Upendra starts blushing. He was very shy. He says, well, it's the, it's the positioning of these bird. No, no, what's the meaning? Nobody knew. These bards, he pronounced bards, have lived in this tree for two weeks. He, he uh, counted. And then he laughs. Uh, see, even birds are attached to their apartments. <laughs> We're riding in the car in West Bengal. As you know, in India, the horn is so important, more than the motor, the brakes. <laughs> That's one of the first things that I discovered. And when you do the horn, the cows, the dalwalas, Every kind of wallow. People that go to the side of the road, automatically the horn breaks. Prabhupada says, give me my tali, give me my cane. Out the window he goes, bang, 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 bang. All the doll wallows, the cows, they go cry. He laughs and says, they will think it's an American invention and try to imitate. <laughs> yeah, speaking of cars, Prabhupada and cars, when we were in India, we, we came here in October 1970, um, Srila Prabhupada liked me to drive him for some reason. I mean, India, driving in India. So I would always drive him. We had a big American Chevrolet, believe it or not, 52 Chevrolet in those days. A life member donated it for our use. So I, I drove, by now he's Prabhupada. I drove Prabhupada around all over. And one time, we were, that time we went to visit Lalit Thakur in Birnagar, which is between Mayapur and, Vrinda, and uh, Calcutta. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to take a back road. Prabhupada wasn't really sure how to get there. But at one point he says, I think it's that road there. So we, we started driving down that road a few kilometers. And we came to a bridge. This was just after monsoon season. And the bridge had washed out on both sides about this far, over a meter. 
the, the water had washed the mud out from the road, roadbed and the bridge stood isolated without touching each side. And the whole car was full of uh, sannyasis, and Gurdas was there too. Maybe four men crammed in the back. And oh, yeah. I said, what should we do? She probably, we can't, we can't go any further. And we're not even sure if this is the right road. He said, he just turned around and he told Gurdas and the other boys to get out of the car. Okay, they got out, slammed the door. And he looked at me and says, now you back up and go very fast <laughs> and we will jump over. <laughs> wow, I love this stuff. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Took off. We leaped over and hit the bridge and shot across it and leaped the other side and came to a roaring stop with all this red dust flying. And I looked back and all the brahmacharis and sannyasis were running across the bridge. And I looked at Prabhupada and he didn't even, wasn't even batting an eye. He didn't even <laughs> want to talk about, how, uh, about it. Tell him about the time he got in the wrong ambassador, which is an example of how beautiful India oh, is. Yeah. We used to walk <clears throat> many mornings on the Worley Sea Face. <clears throat> and as you know, all the cars parked right along the road there. And in those days, there were only two kinds of cars in, in the streets. There were little Fiat type, taxi types, and white ambassadors. There were thousands of them. So we parked one morning. I had an ambassador from, I think, Kartikeya Mahadevia gave it to us to use. Uh, but I was driving. <clears throat> and after our walk, we came back to the car, got in, and the, the key wouldn't work. It would go in the slot, but it wouldn't turn. <laughs> and Prabhupada's sitting in the back seat with Shruta Kirti. I said, Prabhupada, for some reason the car won't start. It's broken. So I'll go out and I'll hail a taxi. And while I was gone, the two men who owned the car came up to the car and said, oh, you're sitting in our car. Wonderful. Can we take you home, Swamiji? <laughs> <laughs> and, so and, they, they uh, took him home and I had to follow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and to show his magnanimity in Vrindavan, he says, Gurudas, you're our panda. Take us around. And so if you've been to the Govardhan Echo Village, it recreates this. And so the temples, the seven temples, stagger the arti. So you can go to all the seven temples. So we're in one of these cars. It might have been that one that they made with the siren and all that. At any rate, we're in a car. You were driving. And, and Prabhupada's in the front. And he puts myself and Gargamuni and Brahmananda in the back seat. So it looked like a football team were in the back seat. <laughs> and then, and then he, we're riding down the road and he keeps on saying, come on, he sees the vote, he's walking. So now there's three people sitting on our lap and then Pancha Davida is ambling along and he puts him in there with the danda sticking out in his feet. <laughs> so each temple is, is like the clowns in the circus. I don't know if you ever see the circus, but we're probably, finally we left the shoes, left the cars, and walked. But that shows you Prabhupada's magnanimity. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of another clowns in the car story when you said that. <laughs> In those early days in San Francisco, we had no money. Right. And we didn't know how to raise money. So Malati had an idea that mm, she should get the other girls together and have a little dancing troupe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and advertised that people could invite us to their homes <laughs> for some cultural enlightenment from India. What was their name? <laughs> Malati and her dancing gopis. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the photo. So I wrote up a, you know, a glowing press, re uh, press, press release and sent it out to all the newspapers. And by golly, the biggest newspaper in San Francisco, the Chronicle, they liked the idea. And so they sent their, one of their uh, columnists 
out who did a weekly column on the, what's <laughs> happening in San Francisco, and she talked about dan Malatin or dancing gopis and gave us the phone number, put our phone number in there, that this was a real treat, you should do it. So all these very important rich people living in San Francisco started calling and inviting us to their homes for these <laughs> da dancing and singing, <laughs> a night of dancing and singing. But that devil worshiper with the lion was at one of the of things, you remember? Bon and Levee. Tom Levee. Yeah. Yeah, we were bon put Levee. together with this satanic worshiper who had a lion. It just shows you, it's well, his, stranger than fiction. And his altar was a naked woman. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Very strange days. Anyway, yeah. we, we went out, all we had was one old station wagon, a Studebaker station wagon that burned so much oil. <laughs> Every five mi miles I had to stop the car and put in another quart of oil. And we are in, so we packed 10, 12 devotees, our dogs, our madungas, our harmoniums, everything we had, and food, prasadam, into this little this station wagon. And we had to drive about 30 miles up to Marin County for this giant palatial mansion. It took about half an hour to drive up their driveway. It was such a vast estate. So we pull up in front, in front of that place, and the, the clowns in the car all come pouring out. So we're so happy because the oil fumes have been killing us. We made it, the car made it, and the dogs jump out, and the first thing they do, of course, is go over and urinate on their, on their <laughs> tailored gardens. And, and at the same time, in the window by us, all the little white poodles that belonged in this place came to the window and started barking and tearing up the furniture, seeing our dogs. So the, the host came out. He was, quite, <clears throat> he was quite surprised to see us. <laughs> uh, we walk in, and he's got 50 of San Francisco's finest sitting in there, like in tuxes and stuff. This is an elegant evening for them. First thing, we're trying to set up in there. And move things around, and Gurdas is taking photos. And they had a Ming vase there, one of those probably worth a million dollars, Chinese. And Gurdas, he's trying to focus his camera, he's backing up across the room, and he knocks over the Ming vase with his butt. <laughs> it didn't break. And we're shoving these chairs around, and the lady kept saying, wait, that's a Louis XIV. Be careful with that chair. <laughs> and they were Republicans, so we brought Ganesh, remember, because uh, of the elephant. Uh, I don't remember that. But. So we did our kirtan, and they, the, the, res the response was almost nil. They just had no clue who we were, <laughs> what we were talking about. So they asked, they asked, one of the guys in the crowd asked, can, do you know Havana Gila? And I don't, didn't know what Gurdas knew what it was. It's a Jewish chant of some kind. Havana Gila. So he so said, sure, we know that one. And Gurdas led us in Havana Gila. And then we were about to do another chant, and the host stood up and said, well, thank you for joining us tonight. The go Malatine are dancing gopis. We'll be leaving now. <laughs> As we slipped out the door, he slipped us a $100 bill, and we were gone. Yeah, Krishna is all attractive. The, being with the Prabhupada, the Swami, and everything around him was just so much fun. Can, mm -hmm. huh? So he's spoon feeding us. And so then one day he says it's Lord Chaitanya's appearance day. He had to slowly even say who Lord Chaitanya was. He did the prayers on a slate board. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda. Sri Advaita Sri Vasudeva. He wrote it out for us. So now it's Lord Chaitanya's appearance day. And I want you to go in the temple and chant Jap and chant Kirtan and read this manuscript. And it was an unpublished manuscript of the Chaitanya Chaitamatra. But so kindly, he says to Makunda, 
I, I want you to fast all day also. But if you can't, here's some rock candy for my boys and girls. He was like our father. Gender wasn't a thing. We were his children. So we go in the temple, and we chant. And there's this devotee, Jayananda Thakur. What a great devotee. And he was the president of the temple. And this other devotee, sweet Jivananda, from Texas, he took one bite of prasadam and stayed forever. So Jivananda, Jayananda, come over to me. They go like this. Let's go out. I said, well, the Swamiji told us we could stay in the temple all day. They said, he was the president. And also, Jivananda, Jayananda, I figured two Anandas are more important than one Das. <laughs> so we go outside and we go to, and there was a place that Jamun and I used to live in, and it's the second floor, and Swamiji was there, and we're chanting, and he comes to the window, and he goes like this. And I said, I told you, Anandas, we're in trouble. He told us to stay in the temple. He's telling us to go away. And crestfallen, we went down the hill. And Upendra comes running out. The Swamiji wants to see you. Uh-oh. You know, I don't know if you, but like me, I had to go to the principal's office a few times in school. So this is the Maho principal that... And we go up there, and Opendra says that. And we said, the Swamiji told us to go away. He says, no, in India, that means come here, come here. Oh, oh. And when we got in the room, he had this oceanic smile, and he said, Lord Chaitanya, Chaitanya Guru, has given you the intelligence to chant this outside the temple as well as inside, and this is called Harinam Sam Kirtan. <laughs> and do this every day. And we did. Vishnu John, Jamuna. Cool. Now another example of... That was John Nunda's spontaneous thing. Right? Yeah. Another example of uh, the Swami's extreme tolerance. I mentioned earlier that we were trying to get Prabhupada's attention all the time. And at one point, you all know the story of how Jagannath appeared. And so that was my first really big attention getter with the Swami that I was going to carve the first set of Jagannath deities. So I bought the wood and I put in my apartment at the very far end of Haight Street, maybe 10 blocks from the temple on hate and lion and I was working up there carving the, the Jagannath deities three of them and we also knew and so I was this was my big service I was so happy because I could go and, and then almost every day to Prabhupada's room and or the Swami's room and say uh, what color uh, paint should I can is wood paste all right to use to fill in holes oh get his opinion can I use this color instead of this color like that? I was getting his attention by carving these deities. And I also knew that he wouldn't leave San Francisco and go to New York until the deities were installed. So I deliberately went real slow. That was our plan. Yeah, it was all of our plan. Yeah, yeah go slow on those really deities. Slow. He, he was only going to stay two or three weeks, and two months went by. We're into the third month. So one day, I'm up carving, working on the deities and uh, the Jagannaths, and bang, bang, bang on the door. I open it up, and there's the Swami. <laughs> he must have walked all the way down Haight Street with Upendra. <laughs> and he walks in. He's, he, didn't, he wasn't angry. He was just stern. And he said, oh, so let me see. And I showed him the result that Krishna was done. Balaram was done, and I was working on Subhadra, but she, she was just in the initial stages. He said, well, I'm, I must get out of here, uh, so I'm setting a deadline. That was Lord Chaitanya's appearance day in March 23rd, 26th, whatever it was. So I had to finish, I had to get him done. But the Swami came to my house, 
That's the kind of thing you did to get his attention. And then on his way out, well, my dog knew him, so there was no problem with the dog. But on his way out, he saw a pack of, a little packet on top of Lord Jagannath's head, which was standing there in the corner. He said, what is that? And I said, well, those are my cigarettes, Swamiji. He went, whack, with his cane and knocked them right off of Jagannath's head, and they went across the floor. And he said, you need to give up this habit. And then he, t he told us, told me later, he said, just try to smoke one less each day. Mm. Wow. Like that's how tolerant Srila Prabhupada yeah. was. Yeah. And smart, practical. Yeah. He you never know, left you stranded. Yeah. It's practical. And, yeah. Like on the way to Vrindavan, they thought he was going to do a, a shloka, and he says cement. Practical. But... Again, he's teaching us, so the next thing he's innovating, not, now he's Harinam. So, of course, we didn't learn so easily, and Malati didn't learn. So, there's this India import store, Cost Plus, and we thought everything from India was holy. Oh, Akirtan, huh? Akirtan. Huh? So, she, there's a thing in America called the five finger discount, <laughs> which means you steal. So, she. Stole this little thing from India, and she goes before the. Now the Swamiji, we know he's awesome. It's not just fun. We realize this really teaching is the Vedic culture, and there's more than just the jolly, sweet, compassionate Swami. He's really giving us something of tangible. He identified that. So she says, "Is this from India?" And he bows down. And what did he say? You brought me Krishna. And he said, oh, there's some others? And she said, yeah, I think there's a yellow one and a white one, and uh, go get them. So she goes, 10-finger discount. <laughs> 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 the, other, the Then he asked him to carve these. Yeah. I think probably the main thing that, that captured us, that how the, what the Swami did to capture us in those days, Gurudas, we, we already lived a lifestyle that was based on magic. We, we needed things to happen every day in our lives by themselves that made us happy or gave us pleasure. So you could call that magic because you don't expect cause and effect. If I do this, that will happen. You just let things happen. That was our creed in those days. And the Swami was like that. He was go the personification. The, go with the flow. Go with the flow. He, the, <coughs> Swami was the personification of magic. He told us that magic happens because of Krishna. And Krishna controls everything that happens in all of creation at every moment. So if he wants it to happen, it will happen. Mm. These magic things like Jagannath appearing or any number of dozens of stories that we could both tell. Yeah, the money fall. That's, an, that's the, one of the first magic stories in San Francisco. We had no money. Jayananda was the only devotee that worked. He had a job driving a taxi. <laughs> I had two jobs. Oh, he might have had a job. I worked a little bit, carpentry yeah. jobs. But for the most part, <coughs> we had no money. And we were feeding hundreds of hippies a day. We had rent. We had so many expenses without any fixed income. There was no Sankirtan. There was no Back to Godhead magazines to sell, anything like that to make money. So early one morning, uh, in the winter time, it was cold, Malati and I left our house on Ashbury Street and started to walk toward the temple for morning kirtan, early in the morning. And it was still dark, and it was fog. There was a lot of fog in San Francisco, especially in the morning. And as we walked up the street, uh, we saw something came flying out of the fog, and it landed at my feet. I looked down, it was a $100 bill. Benjamin Franklin. And we started looking around. There were $100 bills flying everywhere. It's like a snowstorm of $100 bills. So we ran around picking them all up, trying to find out how this happened. There was no one else on the street. And we ran to the temple. I think it was close to $2,000, which in those days would be like 50000 now. And so we were able to pay uh, all the rent, back rent. We, they were going to kick us out. 
paid the back rent, uh, forward rent. We bought it. Malati bought a new rug for the temple, so we were warm finally. And uh, we fed hundreds of hippies with that money for weeks. So that was magic. There's a drawing of that. Did you know? I think so. I have it. I'll give it to you. Bhagdi Siddhanta. And he did another, an, another drawing. This just shows you Teju Guru. It's not exactly Prabhupada, but it shows you how we have to listen to intuition. On the way to India, we were in this really... Was your plane a two-engine two plane, too? Yeah, Bosco Airlines. C3. The, the, the cockpit was surrounded, separated by a blanket. No, no door. Giraz is sitting next to me. Maya's everywhere. He just comes from the Boston Temple. There's 17 of us. There's a guy with a goat. Somebody's throwing up in the aisle. We get to Cairo, Egypt, transferring. So I was in charge. I had to make sure everybody's bag and baggage was transferred. So I go there, and Prabhupada told us to bring a lot of equipment. So we had so much equipment, I had a new Super 8 camera. And so it was the day after President Nasser was assassinated. So the country is in disarray, just like when President Kennedy, everybody knows where they were. The, the whole airport has black and big paintings, portraits of President Nasser. So I go and make sure the bag and baggage is transferred. Giri Raz takes the other 16 devotees out in the tarmac and he starts chanting. And they're jumping up and down. And I have the new camera. There's Nasir, there's the airport, it's black. There's the devotees chanting. Oh, there's the soldiers with guns and bayonets rushing at the devotees with red eyes and drooling mouths. Chaitra Guru enters me. I get between the soldiers and I say, we're singing in the praises of President Nassau. <laughs> and then they became our guard. So you have to use your intelligence for this. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't even touched on uh, London yet. Jeez. At one point in San Francisco, we, we had been there a year, a year and a half. Every, the early devotees were getting a little antsy because it, it was, this temple was going on now. There were things happening without us needing to push. And we were antsy to <coughs> go somewhere new and try something different. You, you wanted to go to India, you and Jamuna at one point, and I know Mukunda and Janaki wanted to go off somewhere. I did too. So, but we had seen uh, Prabhupada talk about London so many times. All he did was talk about England and London, and we knew that he really wanted a center there. He had sent devotees there before, and they had failed, or they hadn't stopped at the airport like they were supposed to. Kirtan none. Anyway, so. We got the idea that we would propose to the Swami that we go to London and start a center. And we were good friends, Gurdas, his wife, Jamuna, Mukunda, and I, and Janaki, and, and Malati. And Prabhupada agreed, and he sent us there. And we, we thought we wanted to do something really grand in London because this is Prabhupada's favorite place outside of India. He wanted something in London more than anything else. Uh, so we, we got there in like the 1st of September 1968 and we saw right away that this was going to be very slow work to do it on the scale we wanted to have there for Prabhupada. He pushed us in letters almost every day we'd get a letter saying, why haven't you got a place to rent yet? But it didn't fit our idea of what we should have for Prabhupada when he comes to England. <laughs> yeah, this is, Gurdas just mentioned that our idea to build something grand in London actually took root in San Francisco before we left. I bought a, a shipment of redwood, beautiful California type of wood that would go into our new temple in London when we built it and shipped it before we left. That's how sure we were we would do something grand. <laughs> There was nothing. nothing. We, we had one-way tickets. 
<laughs> and, and $600 to split between seven people. And, and uh, immigration. It was $50 too. Fifty immigration from, was very was strict in those yeah, days. We the money around. Yeah, we switched the money around. We pulled all kinds of pranks. But right away we knew that it wasn't going to be easy. And first thing we thought, well, even San Kirtan, people don't even notice us in a big city like London. We're going to have to shave our heads, guys. This is it. Off goes those long curly locks. <laughs> Duradas was the first. Malati cut his hair and then she shaved his head. God, he looked awful. There were <laughs> cuts and scratches all over him. She missed places. And but we were having so much fun. We were just couldn't get off the floor. We were laughing so hard. <laughs> and then we had to do it. And then we had to go get matching clothes. We didn't know what dhoti, you know, how to tie a dhoti or anything or what, where you would even buy a dhoti. So we just bought these long bed sheet, long bed sheets. <laughs> and we dyed them daffodil yellow. And we thought, well, this, this might be a color they wear, the monks in India. And, and <laughs> we couldn't find yellow sw sweaters, so they, they got us orange sweaters because they were sort of close. <laughs> uh, we got our outfits on, and we put on T-Lock, and then people started noticing us. <laughs> but still, it took so long. I mean, we lived to be with the Swami at every moment. We could have sent him one telegram, said, come, and he would have been there the next day. But where would we have? We wanted to make him feel in London like it was his capital city. It was the main place that he'd always dreamed of. And we couldn't do it in a little storefront out in the suburbs or anything like that. We wanted to be right in the middle. So we pushed, pushed, pushed Krishna to help us. We made Krishna personally intervene to give us a, a skyscraper building in the heart of London, uh, accommodations at one of the richest men and the uh, most famous men in the world's home mansion in the in, the, in Buckinghamshire. Uh, so that by the time the Swami came, one year later, one year we missed him. One year we went without the Swami. It was, it was, it was. You can say it was suffering. Yeah, it was suffering in a way. Great we sacrifice. We didn't even live. We were living scattered. scattered then we were all given over. a warehouse. Called yeah. Malti lived in a box. He made a little window. <laughs> Malti lived in a box. Anyway, maybe you know the stories. But finally everything came together. And we got to see Krishna's magic maybe more than anybody else. I mean, Krishna just came in and did everything on a scale that by the time the Swami arrived, exactly one year later, the Hare Krishna mantra was being heard on the radio by millions of people Sparkles every day. London, they said. It was, we were on television all week long. We were, uh, the magazines, periodicals were all about the Hare Krishnas. Uh, Prabhupada got picked up in a Rolls Royce limousine and taken to a great mansion in the countryside. By He's one of the famous people in the world. Four most famous people in the world. He spoke at Conway Hall, where you know, great sages have spoken in London for decades. Like that. So Prabhupada arrived in England like a king. That, that's a perfect ending, but I'd like to do some more. <laughs> but it is, I mean, you can edit. That's a <laughs> two, two stories to show Prabhupada and flexibility and how you have to be bold. And So now I'm standing in the charter bank line and somebody says, do no Samson door. And I said, yes, and he's here and there's a building. And so now, Sam Shinda can build it in Prabhupada's eyes, that photo of him so proud and so happy with what you did. And now we had to get it zoned. And a neighbor, Mr. French, said that every time we chanted in the morning, 
the sound would go through the wall and his wife would faint and his dog would jump up and down and go yip, yip, yip. <laughs> so every time, Nama Om, yip, yip. So now all the officials are there. We had to borrow chairs from the Theosophical Society. A zone for two people, but now we had 35 people because of attractiveness. The sleeping bags were hidden. So the contention, Mr. French had a, the fencing Olympic champion as the solicitor, and we had Lord Goodman, the prime ministers, and all there, and they're in the hall. And so the doors open. Oh, because in the market. had a decibel meter that read sound, a little machine. Right. Yeah, they were very stroppy. And also because of the Mahabharata, when Krishna, Aswatthama, the elephant, mm, he plays tricks, he shapeshift into Abhimanu to trick. Krishna's tricky, so we said we can be tricky for Krishna. So now the door's open, and there's a big window he put in their door, redwood door, and the door's open, and we're chanting, and these are cartels. <laughs> door closed. Madanga, door open. Makunda, door closed. Door open. Hurry, bowl, hurry, bowl, door closed. <laughs> they say we can't even hear it in the hall. How can you say it's going through the wall and your wife is fainting and your dog's going? He said it's a bloody trick. He takes the doorknob, it comes out of his hands, he's a raccoon caught in the lights. He claws open the door, he said it's a bloody trick, and 35 sleeping bags fall on his head. <laughs> but because George Harrison was our guarantor, that helped. They zoned us. Don't do this at home, folks, but <laughs> maybe for Krishna. One more story? Yeah. And this is, this is very showing Prabhupada's flexibility, understanding, seeing into a horse, seeing that gender isn't important, seeing that separation isn't important, seeing that ashrams are not the, it's what we have in our heart. So now Madhavisa was in San Francisco, he's a new brahmachari, and, and, and we fed people all the way out, out the door, there were so many people, there were two mats, and Jamuna Malati decide, and the brahmacharis, Madhavisa and the brahmacharis, one of their only pleasures was prasadam. And they tried to ascertain what was in the pots, <laughs> and then Jamuna Plate by plate, they had to pass it to everybody out in the street. So the next week, Madhavis and the, the uh, brahmacharis go out in the street, but Jamuna feeds the people in the front first. So he was a great devotee, but now he's a sannyasi. It's a new sannyasi, so he really, really had to be very resolute about not being with women. And he was very attractive to women and everything like this. He had to really be resolute, not even be any place closer. Now we had the deities in Vrindavan. It was the last stage. The deities are coming from Jayapur. It took years. It's, they're coming to Vrindavan. We just need somebody to go there on that side and make sure. So Prabhupada sends uh, Madhavisa Maharaj to Jayapur to do this alone with Jamuna. And it was really funny because he told me the story and his voice got higher when he did. He said, we were in the rickshaw and it's small and she was large. I tried to put my dunder between us. <laughs> but in two days, gender didn't matter because she was so resolute in her service. And Prabhupada knew this. So this is another lesson. That we have to just love one another, serve one another. It doesn't matter the ashram. So much... All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hare Krishna. Let us thank His Grace Sham Sundar Prabhu and His Grace Gurudas Prabhu for their wonderful narration of Srila Prabhupada's flooding river like Katha, but three times loudly chanting. Hare Krishna.